Now, we were all told that we had to get outside our comfort zone, and so I have done that to some extent. I'm not going to present any research data, so that takes me right side, outside my comfort zone. But I'm not going to go as far as the group this morning, and all I could say is I'm really glad I wasn't in that session this morning. Rosemary's waving to me, um, because they certainly went way out my, outside my uh, comfort zone. So I'm talking about, except nothing's coming up, Sorry, I'll go back. I'm, actually, I'm talking about the power of now. So I'm going down a different avenue than the speakers this morning, but I'm actually going to pick up some of what they've said. And I'm going to really step outside my comfort zone and tell you a story that I heard overseas um, this year about a, a little boy and his frog. And he had a pet frog, and he wanted the frog... He, he said to the frog, you know, I really want you to be unique. I want there to be something special about you, and, and so I think you should learn how to fly. And the frog said, well, you know, that's not really my area of expertise and I don't think I really want to learn how to, oh, it'll be fine, no, no problem. So he waited a couple of weeks, then he went back to the frog and said, right, today's the day, we're going to get you to fly. Took him inside up to the first floor, put him on the window ledge, pushed him out, and of course the frog went plop and broke its leg. And he said, well, we'll keep trying, you know, this, this will get better, it'll be all right. Waited another few weeks and went back to the frog and said, I really want you to be unique, so you really need to learn how to fly. And the frog said, this is really not my thing. I'm, I'm a frog. No, 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 I'll be fine. So up they go to level six, put some on the window ledge, and said, all right, you're going to be unique, you're going to fly. Pushes him off, and he goes splat and dies. Now, the moral of that story is that the little boy wanted a frog that could be unique. And what he forgot is he actually had a frog that was unique. He had a frog that could talk. <laughs> and I... <laughs> And I'm going to talk about some of the things that I think make us unique, that we forget about. And so in the moment that's now, we make decisions that necessarily we probably wouldn't normally make. There's a short-termism about now, and that's what I want to talk about, some examples of where we might have got things wrong and how I think we have to proceed so that when we have to make decisions in the here and now, then we're actually ready for now. There's two things that I think as a profession make us um, unique. Remember, I'm a researcher, so I play around with numbers. If you just took the number of nurses in the country and divided them into the population, you'd have a nurse-to-population um, ratio of about 1 to 64. But if you do some creative mathematics and estimate that probably out of the 377,000 nurses that we have working, probably four times that number that are retired, then you take away all of those people who are too young to actually know and understand what nursing is, and you end up with a nice figure that probably the nurse to person, person ratio in Australia is one to 14. So that means every 14 people, they know someone who's a nurse. But there's a more interesting piece of research, and it is Australian, because Christakis has now got six degrees of separation down to three degrees of separation. So that means if you think about looking around, because we're all nurses just about, so that's all right, but go to any other audience that you go to, one in three people there is probably a nurse. So we are really well known. The second, so, that gives us a huge capacity. We are the biggest workforce in the biggest um, industry in the world. And it's the only industry that's going to grow in Australia. And by 2020, I think it's growing 16%. So we are the growth industry. The second thing that makes us really quite different is that we have been ranked as the, the most um, respected in terms of ethics and honesty for 14 years. So we have huge social capital. When we speak, and we're speaking with the, the, the population behind us, it makes us really quite powerful and quite unique. We have to bear in mind that that means a lot. It means a lot to the public. So if you combine our size and our reach and the trust that we have, there's lots that we can do when we put our mind to it. So let me give you a couple of examples of where I think we might have, with the benefit of hindsight, acted in the here and now that we might have changed our minds if we were able to do it again. And the first is, if you just think about undergraduate preparation, and you know we were all probably in this room, a large part of, number of us were part of the decision to go for the three-year degree. I think because we thought if we don't take the three-year degree, we won't get anything else. And yet, who's the only profession that's got a three-year degree? It's nursing. Not commenting on any of the ones behind me, but there are some there that I find I, I can't believe that they have a four-year degree and we still have three years. So it's easy to say in hindsight that maybe we should have held out but now we're in the position of playing catch up. And I do think there's a groundswell that says we probably do need a four-year degree. The second time, or the second instance, 
I think, where we perhaps should have hesitated before we accepted what we were given is the role of nurse practitioners. So if you look at the United States, they've got a population of 322 million. They're about 14 times our size. So they've got 205,000 nurse practitioners. We would have, at a, at a comparable size, we should have 14,600. Um, and they've got 15,000 completing annually, and the majority of them are not in the public system, well, they're in the public system, but they're not in the hospital system. They're in the community prim primary care area. If you look at Australia, with our population of 24 million, we only have 1,058 nurse practitioners. We don't know how many are completing because there's, a, there's restrictions on, on where we can use them, and the majority of ours are in the public hospital system, and the majority of those, of course, are emergency departments. That's not the best use, probably, of a very highly skilled group of, of um, workforce. And so perhaps we should have thought before we um, said yes to that. Probably the implementation is where we've gone wrong. Now, that's not to say that we don't always get it right, because we do. And whether or not you agree with nurse-to-patient ratios, um, this is an example of where the, the profession has certainly taken the lead and has certainly done some really good things. And ratios, of course, now that they're legislated in two states in this country, we're the, the second country in the world that's achieved that. So after California, this is the only country that's achieved legislated ratios. So whether you agree or disagree, it doesn't mean it's the law. So a director of nursing can stand there and say, I'm sorry, this is the number of staff I need. It's the law. And the reason that that campaign has been so successful in this country, I think there's three reasons. First of all, if you look at the ads, they put patients and their safety first. So under, underneath that is certainly workload, but the important thing was patients and their safety. The second thing was that it was based on research and data, not just national, but also international data. So they, they argued from an evidence base. <coughs> Excuse me. And the third thing is that there was a consistent and very clearly articulated position. And everybody sang from the same song sheet. So if we want to move forward so that we're ready for now, what is it that we need to do? We first of all need to harness our professional power, and so there was some of that this morning. But there's three things that I think are important in what we as a profession offer. First of all is our impact. We know we're going to need more nurses in the future. We know that nurses more likely now than ever before are knowledge workers, they're not doers. And that's the message that we probably need to get across to people. We know and we have evidence that nurses save lives, we know they decrease costs, and we know that they improve the quality of care. So we need to argue our impact. The second thing is that we can value add. And we do have evidence now that says we offer a very cheap but very cost-effective solution to staffing issues. And we need to start thinking about ourselves more as a, we talk about nurses as being a cost, but in fact we're a revenue center and we're probably a rev we should be generating revenue, and we do. We could probably do surgery out here, but when we want to look after those patients, we actually need to bring them into a hospital, and that's nursing care. So nurses can make a difference, and we can certainly value add. And we know we decrease costs, we know we shorten the length of stay, and we know we can keep people out of, out of hospital. So our value adding is significant, and that's, of course, one of the big buzzwords at the moment is value add. tuna for lunch, and that was a mistake. <laughs> mm, very dry. The third thing is our flexibility and innovation. We can do what many other health professions can, can't do, and we do that 24-7, but we can also do what most of them can do. So we're very, very unique and very flexible in that way. We can be first responders for people with chronic and complex conditions, and we should be. The nurse practitioner trial that they've just reviewed in, the, in Canberra, the telling, which was very positive, and the telling thing for me was that many of those institutions, the aged care facilities, kept those nurse practitioners on after the trial. So when it was unfunded, they kept them on. Think about patient-centered home care. There are places that we can be and should be now in the future. So what's our second thing that we need to think about? It's the power of data, and I'm just going to skip over this lightly because you, most of it you will have had this morning except to reiterate, in terms of health informatics, the numbers of nurses that we have in, in informatics positions is very, very low. A senior nurse a couple weeks ago said to me, we've got all these data analytics people in the state now. They're all flinging data at me, but it's meaningless because they're not clini clinically focused. They're not clinicians. They don't know what I need to know as a nurse to manage my system. So we need more nurses in, in that sort of area. 
And that's really all I'm going to say because I think Louise covered it well this morning. The second thing is research, and there's a big R and there's a little R. So big R is probably me as a researcher, but all of you are involved in research. Everything you do, you'll be researching what it is that you want to do and how you can do it better. And research is really about asking the right questions. And if we're focusing on things that affect patients and patients' care and patients' safety, then we're always going to be on a winner. So it's asking the right questions. And I think also we need to think about more broadly about PhDs are not the domain of academics. We need to have a broad church of nurse scientists that are working in, and I know there are some of you here, Lucy, who are, who are working with PhDs in the system and we need far more of you. We need people who understand re data, understand research, and will support it and use the data. And we need to always base our decision making on data because, as Jim Buchan says, we will always be talking about the value of, of uh, grey suits and white coats. We are always going to have to answer the questions of the grey coats. And some of us that are in white coats might end up being in grey coats, but that will happen in time. And the third thing that I think is critical, and it comes as no surprise from me, is leadership. Diana Mason, who is the immediate past president of the American Academy of Nursing, of course, has written the, the handbook on politics and policy. I think it was first published in 1984. But it's still a book I go, to, go back to because there is nothing in it that is not, would, would not resonate now. And she talks about, she's just written about uh, nurses coming out of the shadows. Nurses are often leaders in the shadows. We're most comfortable working behind the scenes to lead change. Some do this well, but when there's a critical mass of shadow leadership, nursing's power and potential are overlooked by others. So we must come out of the shadows. And I think this is the time for many of us to do so. I can probably say I've sat in the shadows, but now's the time for us to speak up and come out of the shadow. All right. Now, and finally, so what's the next thing that we need to do? We can't do this alone. We can't all act as individuals because we're only one, one individual. We have, I think it's 54 nursing organizations in this country. So if you were the government, who are you going to call if you want some information? Who do you want for advice? It's the first thing to think about. Now, the American Nurses Association has the same sort of dilemma, and they've got a campaign to put, I think, it, I think it's 10,000 nurses on boards in the next year. I'm not suggesting that that's what we do, but I do think we have to start thinking about how we might influence the agenda. The second thing is, I think if we want to get to the table, we have to think about ourselves as individuals, and we also have to think about ourselves as a profession. I think we're doing a really good job of preparing a nursing workforce. I'm not as convinced that we're preparing the profession. And so we're preparing people that are work ready, but are we actually advancing what's happening in our, in our profession? I'm not sure about that. And I still, when I wander around the ward, see the command and control models in play. I still see nurses not able to work to their full scope of practice. So that's nurses doing it to nurses, and I think we need to think about ourselves. What we need to be encouraging is the politically astute, articulate, data-savvy nurse leader that steps out of the box and asks us a question that just takes our breath away, and we think, hmm, that's interesting. I don't know the answer to that. Those are the people that we should be fostering in the system. We need to be asking more questions. So. Just to finish up, I think we need to remember that we're in a really unique, go back to my frog, we're in a really unique and privileged position as nurses. And we have a huge power base if we choose to use it. We've got all of those patients out there that we see 24-7. If we touch into, into their action groups and we touch into what it is that's important to them, we can't possibly fail. We've, we've seen that happen with ratios. It was very strongly supported by the, the public because they could understand it. So when we're faced in the here and now with making decisions, either as an individual or as a profession, we need to ask ourselves a couple of things. First of all, what do the data tell us? And if we don't have the data now, then we need to be starting to collect it because we're going to get caught with having to make decisions for which we don't have data. And I've given you a couple of examples where we've been caught out. So do we have data? And we need to be collecting it now. The second thing we probably need to think about is what's the impact of that for the people that we serve and what's that going to do now for them and is it going to improve their health status in the future. But I think most important and the last thing is that sometimes we need to learn how to say no. I think sometimes we have to say no, that's not good enough or no, I'm not happy about that 
or no, I want some more evidence or I want more time to think about it, but we do need to learn how to say no. We shouldn't jump into the here and now and make a decision because we think we don't have any power. We actually do. We just need to use it. Thank you.